Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today we are continuing with our series entitled Dawa Ilallah, and we are using the comparative sciences to make us more effective in the work that we are doing and calling people to submit to Allah. Last few episodes we've been looking at the Seventh Day Adventists, those people who keep the Shabbat, the Sabbath, the Saturday. Shabbat, Hebrew word for the Sabbath. The identifying issues that set the Seventh-day Adventists apart from the rest of Christianity is obviously, number one, the law-keeping, which happens to be article number 19 in the 28 beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventists. So if you had the book, you would look at article number 19, the fundamental beliefs, and it says law. They believe that the law of the Ten Commandments is binding upon every single Christian. So a Christian cannot claim to be a Christian if he does not obey the Ten Commandments. The criticism that has been made by the Christian community against this law that the Seventh-day Adventists keep is saying the Ten Commandments or the commandments were written for the Jew and are not binding in the New Testament to the Christians of today. This is the general consensus that Christians will have. When you ask them, they say, well, the Seventh-day Adventists, they are bound by the law. We are not bound by the law because we are born again. Remember, born again is something that happens when you die anyway. We're all going to be born again. So if you don't know what I mean, you have to look at that episode and you'll have to try and find that episode to figure that all out. So the problem with that theory, where the Christian saying we're not bound by the law, is that when a man comes to Jesus and says, how must I enter the kingdom of God? Mother, be pleased with Prophet Jesus. He says to him, obey the law. And he says, which law? And he goes through the Ten Commandments. So Jesus, peace be upon him, is saying, if you want to gain heaven in the New Testament as a Christian, you need to obey the Ten Commandments and be born again. In other words, die. Once you die and you are born again in the next life, then you will enter heaven but you have to obey the Ten Commandments. So the fact that Christians say that you don't have to means they don't know that the very, very scripture they use to claim that you can go into heaven by being born again is the very scripture that talks about obeying the law. So being unique about keeping the law is not that unique. It should be what every single Christian does, but doesn't do. The second is belief number 20 that is found in their book. And that is keeping the Shabbat, the Sabbath. Keeping the Saturday as a day. The Sabbath should be observed on the seventh day of the week. If any of you take out your calendar and you had to look at your diary or your calendar, you would see the first day of the week is Sunday. Every calendar that's printed, every diary that's printed, every book that's been printed always puts Sunday as the first day of the week. So obviously Saturday is the seventh day. We have no problem with this. The Christians who don't believe that, I don't understand, but we know we'll know that Christians are not very good with maths. Whatever math is involved, guaranteed they're going to get the wrong answer. One plus one plus one is always 740 with Christianity. It never means three. So we'll find that when it comes to the seventh day, of course it means Sunday. But in everybody else's terms, it's Saturday. So there's no way around that. We know for sure that it is Saturday. And when did they keep the Sabbath from? They kept it from the Friday when the sun went down until the Saturday when the sun went down. So that's when the Sabbath was. The Sabbath doesn't start on Saturday morning when the sun rises. It starts on Friday like the Jews have always known it to be. Why am I emphasizing this? Why do I think this is so important? Because some New Testament translators, when they talk about Jesus being dead for three days and three nights, say, but you guys really, I mean... Don't you know that it started on the midnight, like it does with our calendar? The day starts on midnight, so if today is the 15th of January, it becomes the 16th of January at midnight. No, it doesn't, because we're looking at Jewish time and Jewish law and Jewish rules. It started from the sunset, so the 16th would start when the sun goes down tonight. That's the way the Jewish calendar always works. So you can't change it in the New Testament time when it suits you, and say, oh no, you're calculating the times wrong, it's from midnight. No one ever did it that way. No Jewish writer ever would ever, ever think of saying 
time should be measured from midnight. And if you do choose to adhere to that, and you're a Christian and you say, it's from midnight and not from when the sun went down, then by that calculation, Jesus was crucified at 3 o'clock in the morning, not 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the trial of Jesus took place at midnight. Not going to happen, I can assure you. No one in any country would have crucified anybody at 3 o'clock in the morning and would have come out for a trial at midnight. And even if you say, well, how do you know that? Because it says that at 5 o'clock, which would have been time for the sun to rise, it said darkness fell over the whole land. So maybe we don't understand how sun rises and sun sets in this part of the world, but definitely we know how it works in Palestine. And so when it says 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it's not 3 o'clock in the morning. And when it says sun came down, it's not meaning sun came up. So the problem with trying to change times and dates, it might seem something trivial, but if we look at the Sabbath as being from sunrise on a Saturday to a sunset, it brings big problems to other theological issues later. So this is why times and dates are so important. Remember what we said? We understand how time and maths works. Unfortunately, Christians don't. Okay, so that's the second most important doctrine that we find mentioned in the book. Law, if we don't have the law, you're not going to be able to keep the Sabbath. So they have to have the law in place. Then they can keep the Sabbath. Third major belief that we find that is different compared to the other religions is mentioned in several places in the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventists. It's from number 25 right through to 28, the last three. All deal with the second coming and the end times of what they believe, second coming of the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, and what will happen in the end times. So they believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, will return visibly to earth after a time of trouble has taken place. The Jehovah Witnesses believe that Jesus will not come back physically. Seventh-day Adventists mean believe he will come back physically. And during which the Sabbath will become a worldwide installation. They believe when he comes back, Jesus will remind everybody that they need to keep the Sabbath. And that will be the test that they'll have. So his whole mission is to tell people you need to keep the Sabbath. That also teaches in these doctrines that in the second coming that there will be a millennium reign, a 1,000 year reign, where the saints in heaven, that means the Seventh-day Adventists specifically, will reign for a thousand years. And so this whole idea is interpretations of what they read in the book of Daniel and what they read in the book of Revelations. The next important doctrine that they have which is different to the other churches is the understanding of human nature. This is found in belief number 26. Belief number 26 is tied to the end times, but also deals with the whole idea of what human nature is. And they believe a humans are indivisibly united with their body. So you cannot separate the body and the soul. They believe that the mind, the soul, and the body are all interconnected. They do not believe that a person has an immortal soul. So the human nature these things are connected, but they don't believe that necessarily somebody has an immortal soul and therefore no consciousness takes place after you die. When you die, you basically go into what they call soul sleep. And while your soul is asleep, you have no consciousness of everything that's taking place around you. But they believe in something in the 27th belief, which is the way the book used to end, in conditional immortality conditional immortality. You know when you see those old vampire movies or old vampire books when you're a kid and they say a vampire is immortal, cannot die. But it could. Stake through the heart or cut its neck off, it was dead. So it wasn't that immortal. Immortal means if you got stabbed in the heart with a stake, you wouldn't die. If your head was chopped off, you'd still stay alive. You can't die if you're immortal. So the same idea as you find within the Seventh-day Adventist beliefs is that you're immortal but there's conditional immortality. And so number 27 in their book of beliefs, they believe that the wicked will not suffer eternally in a torment in hell, but instead will be permanently destroyed. So what happens if you die and you didn't become a Christian or a Seventh-day Adventist or believer? Your soul will be destroyed. You just don't have eternal life. You just cease to be. So the question has been asked by the congregation to theologians, 
what will happen if mother, father, sister, and brother go to paradise and their other son didn't make it? What will they feel? Won't they ask, like, where is he? And the teaching in the church is that will be removed from your memory. So you won't know that you had another son. It'll just be erased from you. So it was as if they never existed. So those people who don't accept, there won't be a torment of hell and punishment. You'll just cease to exist as if you never were. So we have a similarity between the Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses as far as hell is concerned. However, it must be emphasized that there are Seventh-day Adventists who hold a different view on hell. They believe that there will be a temporary hell. And then after that, you'll cease to exist. So you're still going to suffer for whatever period of time as a punishment. And then you are terminated. Not the terminator, but terminated. And then there is other groups that have a very loose understanding of hell. But generally, they don't accept hell as most other people do. So they believe that in conditional immortality. It's not going to be only those people who choose to accept will have immortality. Those who don't will cease to exist. Let's take a break. When we get back from the break, we'll continue inshallah. In every job that you do, you want to be the best that you can be. To be the best that you can be, you have to follow the example of the best that ever were. When it comes to Dawa, there is no better example than the example of those men whom Allah chose to do the best of jobs. His noble prophets and messengers. Join me, Muhammad Tim Humble, as we study together the methodology of the Prophet in Dawa. Rush to adopt the matchless qualities that make the procedure of Dawa extremely effective in the methodology of the Prophets in Dawa. Next on Peace TV. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Now we're going to move on to fundamental belief number eight, or the belief number eight that they hold, and that is the great controversy. And if you have a title like that, you know it's going to be interesting to read. And the great controversy is that humanity is involved in a great controversy between Jesus and Satan. Jesus and Satan are having this big war between each other. And this is basically a theology or Christian teaching that they have brought up that in heaven there was an angelic being by the name of Lucifer who rebelled against the laws of God. And we said that when we looked at it before, the Jehovah Witnesses, that something that is programmed can't move outside of its programming. I got a wonderful gift today, just to brag a bit. I got a really nice gift today. I got this 1920s computer here and this thing. And they're wonderful. I love them because they operate when I want them to operate. But today I got a nice gift and it was a new electronic gadget. Yay, something more to play with. But it's the most updated new electronic gadget. And now I get to use all the parts and play with all the new apps and all the other things that it has. And it'll do what these two do. But it'll be nice and simple. I'm not telling you what it is because no advertising. But that new gadget cannot make coffee. It cannot transport me home. It cannot make decisions. It cannot make me happier. It might make me happy temporarily. Like, oh, a new app. But that's about it. It's not going to make me breakfast in bed. That's for sure. It's not going to do anything for me. So wake me up. That's about all. Because it only can operate within its programming. And you know what? When I turned the box, it was exactly manufactured 26 days ago. That's how new it is. So it's not been sitting on a shelf somewhere. The manufacturing day was 26 days ago. That's how new this gadget is. 
but no matter how new it is, can't do anything outside of its programming. So how can an angel who is far more up to date, far more relevant than my gadget that was made 20 odd days ago, ever make a decision to rebel against the Creator? This gadget that I have is not going to go back to America, jump out of its shell and attack the Creator that made it and say to the Creator, I refuse to be whatever I am and I'm now going to be something else. I'm going to become a coffee machine. It's never going to happen. No matter how many centuries we wait for that to happen, it's not going to happen. Not with this. So the idea that people have that this this angel, Lucifer, who was an archangel, one of the three, somehow decided, I don't want to be this anymore. I want to become a coffee machine. Is highly unlikely. No, it's not unlikely. It's impossible. It's beyond impossible. And so this doctrine that the Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah Witnesses and the whole of Christendom accept is very, very bad and very, very poor theology. And in fact, it shows God not to be God anymore. And you turn Allah, or the Christian version, you turn him into a demigod, a little god, not an all-powerful god. Because how can an all-powerful god even tolerate such a thing? And this, the Seventh-day Adventists thought this, and he said, you know, people are going to ask this one day, and they're going to say, but how can an all-powerful God, why doesn't he just destroy him immediately? An angel rebelling is not a good thing, especially when you've got a third of them following with you. So this is where the experiment story came in, and they threw the idea that this is all just an experiment to show that Lucifer, that he's a fair God. He had a question. The question that I wanted to ask was, what is the exact perception of the Christians about angels? Do they believe that they are programmed to do only good? Is it in the Bible like that somewhere? Or what is the exact perception? There is a study of demonology and there's a study of angelology. These are subjects that are studied at a university, a theological institution, which would be a normal secular university. So if you went to whatever university you did engineering it, you study theology in the same place. So there's subjects called demonology, angelology, all these different things, like criminology, everything. So this would be studied there. The Bible student who's studying at a Bible college, which is your Christian denomination decided, will learn very different theology on angelology and demonology, very different. Angelology, because a theologian is asked to think deeper, he's like a mufti compared to an imam. The imam is the guy who went to the Bible college. The mufti is the person who studied at a university. So there'll be very different understandings of what an angel is to these two groups. To the Bible student, all it simply means is a messenger of God, no understanding of what his role is or what he does. To the theologian, he is both the carrier of good news, bad news, pestilences, plagues, diseases, sicknesses, wars, He does everything. Anything good or bad, these angels are responsible for. But they will have the same problem I have. It's not possible for an angel to make his own decisions. He is bound by his makings. He can't think outside of his making. So a theologian, a serious university theologian who's graduated with a theology degree can never accept the idea of Lucifer or Satan, even if he's a Christian. So he'll reject that idea. But the Bible student will totally accept that idea and it'll be totally acceptable to him because he's learning only from his doctrinal perspective. We are hoping that the theologian is not looking at it from a doctrine because he's writing doctrine. So this needs to be understood at home. Maybe people don't understand this. But a theologian writes doctrine that the church accepts. The Bible student teaches doctrine that the church accepts. You understand? There's a hierarchy. So you don't find the Bible student writing doctrine that the theologian accepts. <laughs> it's not happening. There's like, this is a lower class and that's a higher class. However, the church doesn't like that anymore. So what the church does today is they bash the theologians. And they say the theologians are non-religious, they don't have a good understanding, they're bad people, they're irreligious, and they elevate the Bible student because now the Bible student is better It's just very convenient to do that because most theologians are finding hundreds of problems with the doctrines and rewriting those doctrines. Like, for example, many of the institutions, many of the religious institutions within Christianity 
theologians have now said it's no longer required for you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Theologians are saying that. Does the Christian church accept what the theologians say? Of course not. Theologians are saying it's not necessary to believe the Bible is the Word of God. Does the Christians accept that? No, of course not. You should be listening to your theologians. These are guys from your own community. They are Christian. They're just Christians who understand that theology is wrong. So you bash them. And so if you want to survive in the real world today, you become a Bible student. You don't become a theologian. So the theologians normally are the guys who write all the books that Christians never read, that we read as Muslims and Jews and Hindus. Everyone else reads their books. So read books by a theologian. Don't read books by a Bible student. These guys that have become well-known all over the world, they're all Bible students, the ones that write those books. They didn't study proper theology. And those who claim they studied theology didn't. They studied theology at their institution. They didn't study it at a university. It might be a university, but it wasn't a university university. It was a Baptist seminary university where they teach medicine and biology or whatever else, but it belongs to a denomination. So be cautious of what you see and what you hear. What is projected is not often what you see. So let's get back to looking at the Seventh-day Adventists. Article 13 is that they believe that the end times there will be a remnant of people, a small group of people who will keep the commandments of God and they will testify to the truth. So they believe that this will happen at the end. And this is tied in with the three angels as found in the book of Revelation where it talks about those people who will stay true in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 to 12 where it deals with the three angels giving witness of those people who will remain faithful to the end. So they believe in this remnant group. There is a mythology that has become popular in recent years about a group of remnants that exist on planet Earth. It's like a secret society. It's like the same which you would talk about the Freemasons or whatever. And it is claimed that these remnants are controlled by a secret organization. They are made up of 12 elders, and those 12 elders are in the inner circle, if you want to put it that way. And they have disciples that they have made. And each of those 12 people only know three people under them. And then they will make a remnant leader, and then they'll cut that chain, and those people under that person only know three people under them. And so it goes on like this. So nobody knows who's above three levels. It's supposed to be a secret organization called like the remnant. And they are controlling everything that's going on in the world. Not only politics-wise, economic-wise, but even religious-wise. So their job is to prevent any religion from getting strong, any belief system from taking over. So if Christianity gets too strong, they will help promote Islam. If Islam gets too strong, they'll help promote Christianity. If capitalism gets too strong, they'll start promoting communism. The idea is supposed to be to keep a balance on everything so no power gets too strong. Whether this is true or not, we don't know because no one can tell because they only know three levels high. So this is part of the remnant community. It's believed to be connected with the Seventh-day Adventists, but there's no proof to this rumor. But you will find the story has become like an urban legend and it's traveling all over. So these are not religious affiliated. They're not political affiliated. They're basically there as balances, supposedly. But that's just by the way since the word remnant came up. The next point that we want to deal with today before we run out of time is the spirit of prophecy. They believe in the spirit of prophecy. The people have the ability to prophesy what will happen in the future. This is Article 18 of their doctrine. And the ministry of Ellen White is commonly referred to as the spirit of prophecy. So when they talk about spirit of prophecy, they're referring to Ellen White. They're not referring to anybody else. So don't be caught in the trap and thinking, oh, it talks about prophets of the future. It's talking about... Ellen White as a woman. That's all the time we have for today's show, so make sure you join us again. So for me, Arib Islam, and all of us here, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Push
مشفق متعطف I'm your brother in Islam, Hussein Yee from Malaysia, and you are watching Peace TV, the solution for humanity.